Yes, yes, yes. Shalom, shalom, chabarim, shalom. Shalom, chabarim. This is Wendem Yadin's brother Yadin here. This is Ras Ayadonis, brother Yadin right here, here, here. Subject matter, you see it on the screen. Where would Kemet, i.e., that's to say ancient Egypt from the Hebrew Mitzrayim, but here, where would Kemet, ancient Egypt, be without Ethiopia? Just let that pause and sink in for a moment. Could we hear a lot of talk about ancient Egypt from many of different scholars in the black, you say, consciousness community? And they always seem to, um, not they, but I'm saying many of the scholars that even, if they, they almost really even mention Ethiopia, right? Like the ancient, when I say Ethiopia, it's about Kush, the Kui land, the God land, like the ancient um, Mitzrayim or the ancient Kemetiu, the ancient Kemites did. All right, so this is why we have to put this front and center. Where would Kemet, ancient Egypt, be without Ethiopia? In fact, Reverend Sterling M. Means, I did a book. It was an interesting book for a, a we could say, a black American, so called Negro, we say Judahite, but a black American um, a reverend or preacher, you know, to do the book that he did. And that book was Ethiopia, the missing link in African history. Now, we have continued to build on that essential reasoning there, and we call it Ethiopia, the ancient, e Ethiopia, the missing link, let's get this right, Ethiopia, the missing link in biblical, <laughs> in our biblical history. Yes, 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 you just had the power up right there, yeah. Ethiopia, the missing link in biblical history. And in our watching and listening and you know, to different ones presenting knowledge, information on some of the different platforms. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's including some of the popular platforms. You know, we have to give um, <laughs> King Ahab, <laughs> we have to give Sarnetta his due. You know what I mean? Just was hearing something with Asar Imhotep, you know, and, and um, King Ahab or, you know, Sarnetta's wife, you know, you know, his woman, uh, Nepal Shada. Now, we just did a video just uh, the other day. We haven't dropped it just yet, but we are going to. Mm -hmm. Ones want to wild out, you know, they'll get wild out in return, you know, but I have to still say give thanks for us hearing and listening and even learning let me say learning, learning his, 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 his perspective and everything, speaking about Asar Imhotep. And originally he was going to do just a vid, you know, just about that, what we was picking up. He made some very, very good points, right? Points that we have, um, some points that are similar to points, you know, that we have made. And it was refreshing to hear someone who really seems to have a, a, a grasp, you know, of the study called Egyptology, generally speaking, but from a black, from our perspective, and connecting the dots that need to be connected, you know, in our history and knowledge of self, as just as black people and ancient black peoples, right? When we talk about Kemet, ancient Egypt, and even the Bible and the Hebrews, talking about ancient black peoples, regardless of what they want to make believe, make you be like Eve, right? So here, 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 we're seeking to address this here concerning Kemet. Because Kemet, the roots, what's the roots of Kemet? How many blacks are out there? And even to Sarnetta, a House of Consciousness, which is a big platform out there in the black conscious community. How many scholars do, do y'all have that really can bring forth the connection? One scholar I would recommend right here, and I'm not saying that he, he's, he will come forward. I mean, he's, he shared his knowledge, and I kind of heal up the brother if he still checks out our videos and, and you know, is linked out there. Please link, you know, check out the contact information speaking about Legacy Allen, my right? brother Legacy Allen, right? This is, this is one of, I would say, he is, he is one of our unsung scholars out there, at least his work. I know he really wants his work, the work that he has put out there, the research he has done. And he's been researching the, what we call, and we seeking to coin this phraseology, the linguistic, linguistic archaeology. Now, listening to Asar Imhotep on the Sarnetta platform, right, um, it's still playing now, but I think it was either streamed a, a day or so ago, 
Um, he mentioned about linguistics. You know, he mentioned about linguistics. Now, there's more to it. I would like you all to get it for yourself. We're not going to like regurgitate everything that was presented. But in the portion that we got to see and got to hear and got to, you know, meditate on, it pointed to some significant matters that we have to once again bring forward. The importance of language, right? The importance of language, you know, linguistics. In fact, let's just touch on this a little bit right here brothers and sisters language why is language important why is linguistic archaeology what is linguistic archaeology stay tuned we'll see to just have a vlog a vid where we can be more prepared just to go into linguistic archaeology what we've been doing right in many of the vlogs the videos on the podcast and the audibles check out the audibles seeking to get some of the audibles in circulation the podcast we just share many different audibles you know, the Torah reading and feeding, linguistics, going into the, the Psalms, going into key words. Also, of course, in connecting with archaeology and also Egyptology, right? Because Egypt is very, very important, I would say, to we as Hebrews and as Israelites as a point of reference, right? As a point of reference. And even many of the Kemetic and the black scholars like Asar Imhotep and others, you know, are speaking out and have spoken out of the the, the bias, the anti so called Negro. Something he said about the Negro, you know, that like how they're trying to say over there, like Dr. Hawass and some of those over there in Egypt, you know, the so called Arab. I say so called Arab because they're Arabic speaking, but who are they? You know, we're talking about who we are, right? And yes, we need to know who we are, but it might be a little bit easier to find out who these other people are, first of all. Right? And we say the ancient Egyptians, well, the ancient Mitzrayim, yes, they were black people. I want to say this on the record. They were black peoples. Right? Black peoples. Black peoples that, according to their own testimony, right, came down the Nile right, from the headwaters or from the source of the Nile. And the source of the Nile is in that region that's occupied by the modern countries of Ethiopia, Tanzania, uh, Wakanda, Uganda, Kenya, you know, those particular regions right there in what's referred to as the Horn of Africa. But then we also have the links deeper south, right, when we go down to like even South Africa, right? So there's some key points, right, along especially the east, the east. You've heard me say before, and I'll say once again, east of the river land, <laughs> east of the river now I said the river land East of the river now Our inheritance Hebraically speaking Is east of the river now And between the rivers Is between the rivers The river of Egypt That's also known as the Gihon Or the river of Ethiopia Right along the east And also the so-called Euphrates Covering what we also have named To be far east Africa When you say far east Africa It's a new way Right it's a new way A neologic a new way a new nomenclature naming for the so-called Middle East amongst we and I and I and like-minded scholars. So when we talk about Far East Africa, Far East Africa is the so-called Middle East. Well, Middle East today politically is Far East Africa. And we're using Africa within the modern, the latter day, the present geopolitical terminology. You already know we've gone into what the original name of the continent was and how the name Africa is a pseudonym, but it's a pseudonym that has significant geopolitical significance and it's a point of reference for us. So even though we say that the name of the concept is really not that, it's a pseudonym, right? You know what I mean? We still recognize its use according to the context that we need to use it, right? So we're just breaking down what's the truth about it, right? You know, what's the truth about that particular name and you know, so forth and so on. But anyway, not much more on that right there. But in speaking about where would Kemet be, right? Ancient Egypt without Ethiopia. Now, we could have gone into a little bit more, you know, without Ethiopia. We could have said ancient Ethiopia, but it fits well. Give thanks to, you know, the LOJ, the meme makers out there. Might also need, you know, more co-laborers, you know, on the promos for the for the for the podcast as well you know i'm putting out a lot of the promos because a lot of knowledge information that's, that's being circulated out there but we know there's a a lot of disinformation also that's being put out there so we just hope i and i people are able to find their way you know to the truth and to the true light of the king of kings christ but here 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 where would kemet be 
without Ethiopia. According to the ancient Egyptians, right, the ancient Kemetiu, if we use that terminology, or Hebrew, the Mitzrayi, the roots, their root came out of, right, what we call the inner Africa, or inner Tob, the inner Tob, because the archaic name of Ethiopia, the Greeks got that from an indigenous Ethiopic, right, we could say a Ethiopic or a Shemitic. And we're going to speak more about the whole um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth thing. Because a lot of you are still believing that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, white race, and white supremacy misinterpretation. The misinterpretation, the racial, there we go, racial misinterpretation of the table of nations. Right? Racial misinterpretation of the table of nations. Brothers and sisters, when we tend to come into the vid like we have uh some talking points let me write this down right here and just share this right here give me one moment brothers and sisters here on this particular vlog here but let's see if we keep this in mind i've been recording this so it's already in the recording racial the racial there we go racial misinterpretation of the table of nations what is the racial well you're used to the racial misinterpretation when they say like one was black so as long as you believe that only Ham, Ham, was black, then you'll never know the true facts, right, concerning the Bible, concerning the scripture, and concerning who's who, right, who's who on the face of this earthly plane. As long as you believe that lie of racism, white supremacy, you will never know the truth. So they say the racist, racist misinterpretation, right, of the table... My table of nations, right? The racial misinterpretation. Race, I said racist, right? Racial, racial misinterpretation. Like Ham was not the only black one. <laughs> Ham was not the only black one. And when I say, you know, um, um, Ham was not the only black man. Let me put it like that. Ham was not the only black man, right? And we have another vlog on that right there. But because we know that Ham was not the only black man, it becomes easier for us to understand the truth of what the Bible is saying and why, say, Ethiopic or Gutas, right, concerning the Ethi what's called Ethiopic, is a Shemitic language. And the Amharic is what is termed linguistically as an Afro Shemitic language. And the Afro part is a part that links with, we say, Africa or black people or the so called Ham, right? We say the Ham, the, the so called Hamitic or the Kemitic. But now, amongst the, the ancient Kemites or the ancient Egyptians, they point in their own. Um, you know, monuments and the records and the artifacts that their roots and the, or the origin of their civilization comes from Ethiopia, comes from the Tob land, the good land, the Kui land, the Egyptians call it the land of the gods. Did you know that the ancient Egyptians referred to Ethiopia, ancient Ethiopia, as the Kui land or as the land of the gods. So Hebraically, that would be the land of Elohim. So think about this for a moment. When the Bible says, when it says in the scripture in, in, in the New Testament, it says that Moshe or Moses, Musa is the head of a fraternal order, according to the Ethiopic learning, the Ethiopic science, Musa, which is how Moses is known in the royal Amharic and in the Amharic language, Musa, Moshe was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts and he was mighty in word and in deed. So to know that ancient Kemet viewed the Tob or the good land, Tob, Tobia, the Greeks would call it Ethiopia, right? Ethiopia viewed Ethiopia as the Kui land, right? The Kui land. And that referred to like the spiritual land, like a spiritual land, the divine land, or the land of the gods. And according to the most ancient artifacts and records, they view that the gods, right? The first, we could say the first set of gods, you know, like Ray, what they call Ra, Ray, you know, first of the gods, right? Came from there, right? Came from there and pointed to their origin. So when the Nile inundated, the flooding of the Nile, it was like receiving, you know, receiving the life, you know, the land, the rich topsoil, the agricultural ground. And that agricultural ground, 
that came down the Nile from Tobia, from Ethiopia, was the source of their life, their food. And this is also links with the Kemet. We talk about Kemet. Kemet, they say, means black. Well, the actual land was so rich in nutrients, it was so reddish brown. If you look at the ground, it was so reddish brown that it was so reddish brown and looked black. You know, almost like, like it would get so red, reddish, brown, dark, reddish, brown that it appears, you know, just like, like at, at the distant eye, it appears black. But when you're up close on it, you can see that it's very dark. It's reddish brown. So that reddish brown ground is what the ancient commit to you or the Chemites, ancient Egyptians waited to come down the Nile so that they can then farm this particular land and have food, you know, for, for, for the season, you know, enough food to last, you know, you could say for, for until the next year, you know, and also when the inundation came forward. Now, for us, it's Rastafari, right? It's very important, the inundation, right? The rise of the dog star Sirius, Osiris, it corresponds to the birth of that man-child of Revelation chapter 12, Tafari, Lidz Tafari, born in the Jasa Gora, Ethiopia, as it says in Psalm 87, verse 4, with Ethiopia, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Now, Rahab, Rahab in Psalm 87, verse 4, refers to, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Hebraicism, it's our own way of referring to Egypt, Rahab, 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 right, Rahab, or not Rahab, it's slightly different there in the Hebrew, but Rahab means a boaster, right, proud, arrogant, boaster, right, so when it says in Psalm 87 verse 4, I will make mention Rahab and Babylon to them that know me, get that right there, that know me, right, with Philistia and Philistia and Tyre, right, Behold Philistia, yeah, it says, Behold Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. Im Kush Ze Yulad Sham. Im Kush with Kush Ze this Yulad. This was born Sham. This man translated says this man was born there, but man being italicized in the KJV version, saying the Hebrew man is not there. This was born there. This we say God man, son of by the son of man, this God man, a man but more than man, it doesn't say man in the Hebrew, it says this was born there. Right? Then also you read more in the psalm and connect with the Elion, the Elion. Now Elion in the Ethiopic refers to Leul, Leul, Leul is prince, right? but it also means one who's higher. Right, one was higher vis a vis their position, role, responsibility. Now, I mentioned all this right here just to give some basic links, right, for why Ethiopia is important, but how many of the black scholars, many of the scholars that are Egyptian scholars, even Asar Imhotep pointed out that many of these ones and ones that say, okay, we're not Egyptian, we're not this, we're not that. And I'm not saying that we are, but we should not dismiss why the importance of the ancient art and facts of ancient Kemet and neither should we dismiss the the record of the ancient Egyptians that their roots the real roots people are looking for the roots of ancient Kemet ancient Egypt in West Africa instead of looking for the roots of ancient Egypt in the Tobe and Tobia i.e. in Ethiopia, Hebraically, Biblically, in Kush, right? As the ancient Egyptians, Mitzrayim, so said even themselves. So right here, 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 here's the brother right here, Asar Imhotep, right? We just grabbed like a screenshot, right? So to grab a screenshot of the brother, here's the brother right here, Asar Imhotep, right? Like I said, recently he's on the Sarnetta, on the Sarnetta Studios um, being interviewed and he made some very, very important statements. He made some very important statements. One, he mentioned that many of the Kemetic scholars out there that say a lot of different things that are inaccurate, first of all, don't have any grasp of the language. I, I would barely say, I, I would say they barely have a grasp of, 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 some, of the, some of them, some of these goofy guys of even English much less to say, you know, of a, any other language, right? Don't read what they call the Metuneta, right? You know, 
Um, even these guys that want to come at these Kemites that want to come at us or Hebrews or Israelites about the Bible, they barely can't even read the Metuneta, much less, you know, read the Hebrew. You know what I mean? So how can you really do real scholarship? You are a regurgitary. You are a regurgitary scholar. In other words, you're a scholar that just regurgitates and can't even fact check, you know, fact check what you're regurgitating. And Brother Asan Imhotep, he made this particular point. And this is a very, very important point that he made right there. Um, it, it didn't give, they didn't give it much emphasis because even, you know, ones and ones, <laughs> you know, you know, they made a whole thing about this Kemetic scholarship, bringing all these people talking about ancient Kemet and black and this now our ancestors and these people and those people. And this is everything came from Kemet, but they barely even know any linguistics and he made a very interesting link with the whole Amun and how Amun or the Amen, Iman, Amun, you know how this word sound is said especially in certain places west right of ancient Kemet like in West Africa right and then he linked with the linguistics you know linguistics but then when he said that well Amun he said Amun is a is a is, is, is a god Right, Amun is, was a god. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, Amun is the same as Amen." So, when you hear people say that Amun is the same as Amen, right? Like in the scripture in the Bible, the Amen. Well, one thing you know is that they are taking similar and saying that similar is the same. Okay, here, here, here. Okay, we're still on. Okay, let's do this right here. We still are on. Apologies, brothers and sisters. We still we didn't put it on airplane mode. Like it's a little bit like in, in the nighttime after the podcast, right? So we would have thought that, well, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> I guess ones and ones are up too, right? So we're going to get into that too. Is our moon the same as our main? Linguistically, linguistically. See, when we have the our main, right? Or we have our moon, let's take our moon first. Now, he made a statement about that. And a lot of people already believe. They believe that this is what the Bible is saying. But it's not. Anyone who understands Hebrew and understand the basic interpretation of what our moon of, of the ancient Mitzri, Mitzrayim, Kemet, you know, the our moon of Kemet, what it means, right, according to the ancient understanding of the Metuneta, it's a noun. Right? Not a verb, it's a noun. But when we get into the Shemitic, the Afro-Shemitic, we get to the real roots. This is why I talk about linguistic archaeology. And even the brother Asar Imhotep also mentioned how important is the linguistic, right? Is, is the language, is linguistic. I've said this to brothers and sisters, those of us who, you know, um, who are Torah or scripture observant. You know what I mean? You know, I say to I and I kosher brothers, brethren and sister, you know, um, you know, about the language, how language, you know, is the key. Linguistics is the key. There's linguistic archaeology. Looking at the language, you find more. We can discover more by the linguistic connections, right, between here and there, you know, and between past and present. And then we can avoid uh, pitfalls of ignorance. See, just to say that our moon and our main is the same, right? That our moon and our main, like our main that's used in the Hebrew, similar does not mean the same. And anyone who knows any language other than English, especially a language, I mean, how many of the Kemetic scholars even know Metuneta? Metuneta. How many Metuneta? How many of them can read that? How many of them know any of the, how many of them know Arabic even? Just even Arabic. You would go much further if you knew a little bit of, Ar if you knew some real Arabic. I'm talking real Arabic. Not that jailhouse stuff. You know, I'm talking about some real Arabic. You know, much more even if you knew some Hebrew. Why do you think most of these ones and ones get a lot of their scholarship through ones who are scholars or academics who happen to be Jews? Right? Because in knowing Hebrew, even right, and I'm talking about Hebrew. And see, what, what, first thing when we say Hebrew, one of them say they speak Yiddish. Y'all don't know the difference between Hebrew and Yiddish. Shut up, for real. Shut up. We'll stop that. So you don't have the tools to really go in. Y'all are regurgitating scholars. 
You're like just kind of vomiting up what other scholars have said and then trying to kind of freestyle. It's like freestyle scholarship, freestyle scholarship. You know, okay, you take this, this, this essay, this paper here, and you read a little bit and you get a little understanding and then you add in your own ideas. And then you build up something that sounds nice to people. You know, like it sounds nice to say that our moon and our main is one and the same and go all over the world, go all over Africa even, but you don't even go to the roots. You don't go to the roots. I'm not saying just go to Ethiopia just physically. Yes, of course, but the linguistic roots. I like to share some of the works of Legacy Allen. Right? Last time we spoke several years ago, he was telling me he was finishing up his um, translation and interpretation based on based on his his um, his his process. He has a certain process, you know, a certain view. You know, his view is that the roots of ancient Egypt, that which goes down the Nile, right, actually originates right from where it went down from. And so the ancient Egyptians point to their roots as being the Tob, Tobia, Ethiopia, the Kui land, or also known as Kush. You know, you ever notice that a lot of these other scholars, scholars of Egyptology and everything, they're always trying to use the Bible to try to explain ancient Egypt. You, you notice that? Instead of just using ancient Egypt, what they find in ancient Egypt to explain itself, they're using the Bible. Even, even Old Testament, I heard even the brother Asara Otep, he said, Imhotep, he said something about Abel, you know, or Cain and Abel and metalworking and so forth and so on. And almost try to make like an analogy of, say, you know, West Africans, right, and, and East Africans. It was, an interesting, it was interesting up until the point he said that, that Hebel, Cain, and, and he, said, he said that it's Hebel to say Abel. He said that Hebel or Abel and Hebrew is from the same roots, like etymologically, that is not true. That's not true. And now for somebody who said that, you know, the linguistic, the language is very important, you know, we were sad to hear that right there, right? Because other things he said that we heard and what we heard was correct, right? But that was a reach. That was, I think he was out of his depth there. But he's using the Bible. A lot of them would use the Bible to explain ancient Egypt. Isn't this weird? Using the, you're saying we stole the Hebrews, we took all this from ancient Egypt. See, because you can read the Bible, you can understand the Bible, but you can't understand ancient Egypt. The whole point is you don't understand ancient Egypt. Many of the ancient Egyptians didn't even understand some things about ancient Egypt. Even when we, people are talking about the, the priests and, and the gods or the natures, the netter, the netret, the netru, you know, and all of that. Metunet uh, in ancient Egypt, they don't understand what it's really about. They're waiting for the European scholars, right, and some of the other, even some of the Arab scholars, have been able to, how can we say, decipher certain more things. I'm not saying their interpretation is correct, and, and it's definitely not correct in many ways, right, but they're deciphering, they have the tools to do the work. Right? Now, I know that our brothers and sisters who are into Kemetic and those who are pro-Kemites and everything, they have the zeal, but they don't have the knowledge. you all got zeal, but you don't have knowledge of the linguistics. And Asar Hotep, Abel or Hebel and Hebrew is not from the same roots according to the linguistics, according to the etymology. I mean, most ones and ones barely even understand English etymology. You know, we speak English, but what do we really understand about the English language? They barely understand English etymology, much less talking about Hebrew etymology. And because a transliterated word, a transliterated word from another language that, that most ones don't understand into English, and we see it in the English Bible, and then another word is transliterated, and we say this is the same word without doing due diligence. Most are not doing due diligence. And this is back to what this whole vlog right here is about. They didn't do due diligence from the very beginning. From the very beginning. The very beginning to do due diligence is to point to the roots, the source. What's the source of the now? You have this uh, James Bruce. 
You know, and people say, oh, he's a white boy and this is the white man coming in to take away our culture and this and that. And yeah, there's some truth to that. But notice what James Bruce was all about. If you know who I'm talking about, James Bruce, look up James Bruce. I think he was a Scottish explorer or something like that. He wrote something, a whole tomb, a tomb, like a volume of books, like a little mini encyclopedia. You know, you know, book one, book two, book three, a, a few, a few, several books, right? In a series under the title, um, uh, was it Explorations, the Source, the Source of the Now, something like that, Exploration. I get the title, apologies, brothers and sisters, but the point was Explorations to the Source of the Now. I think that's what it's called, Explorations to the Source of the Now. He was looking for the source, the source. Ancient Ethiopia is the source, ancient Ethiopia, source of Kemet. Ancient Ethiopia is the source of Kemet. We want to establish that. That's, that's the first point. That's the main point we want to establish right here. All right? Hopefully, as we follow up, we'll take certain, certain um, subject matters. We'll try to focus on certain subject matters because there's a lot. There's a lot that's embedded, a lot that, that is related. You know, like one thing we touch on or talk about can relate to another thing. You know, because this is how reality is. Reality relates. Life and nature is linked with other areas of life and nature. Right? And then it makes the big picture. You know, they say that the sum is greater, you know, than the parts. You know, the, you know, the parts. So we like to zoom in sometimes on the parts, but when we zoom in on this part, that part, to better understand this part here, we have to see, well, how does this connect with other parts? Then as we study different parts and their relationship to each other, we zoom out so we can get a fuller picture, right? So the first thing that many of the scholars, the, the wannabe, right, black scholars, I say wannabe, not that they're not, but their scholarship suffers a serious handicap, a serious handicap. Because it's, it becomes freestyle, right? Freestyle. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like freestyle scholarship, you know? Um, and I say like regurgitating, like, you know, like regurgitating. Basically reading what the, what the other, what the, what the so-called academics or like Garfield would say, the consensus. But it was interesting in the same um, video that was talking about how um, there was supposed to be a recent Recently, there was supposed to be some kind of summit or something like that where certain black scholars were supposed to go to, I think, Egypt and have some symposium or some lecture or some event where they're discussing certain things about the scholarship, about black people and ancient Egypt and everything. And it is said that there's these Arab Russian bots, that these bots were used, you know, to put out fake news and disinfo to tell them that this event that was being planned, I guess, from a while, this event, you know, where black scholars would gather in, you know, in Egypt, modern Egypt, to discuss, like, you know, you could say black conscious ancient uh, Egyptology or cometic science, you know, cometic study from a black perspective, was um, attacked by these Russian, I guess the Russians made the technology, but the... Uh, pale red, the, you know, the Greek, <laughs> the Greek Arabs, you know, the Greek Roman, you know, Arabs over there today, or as some would say, you know, pale red Arabs, you know, because there's racism involved in Egyptology, because many ones like Hawass, that was the guy you probably see in a lot of like uh, History Channel and other videos, a lot of popular videos, he must have been on almost every video that was a kind of pseudo Egypt, you know, about ancient Egypt video out there. You know, there's a lot of videos out there. History Channel did a whole lot, a whole heap of them. You see Hawass almost in every one of them, right? He was like the director, you know, like the director, the king of the antiquity. So, I mean, that's the way he, he, he operated. But he was on the tip of the spear, right, putting out the disinfo, saying that the ancient Egyptians had nothing to do right with black so-called africans or negro people and on the whole negro point that asar imhotep had made that reminds me of the rebuke to some hebrew israelites that we put out there they like to use this zonavan this latter-day modern-day zonavan bible dictionary and they do the same thing they are changing the goalposts 
because in the older dictionaries it made the connection clear that the Ethiopians, right, according to the old Webster dictionary from the early like the 1900s and even before, they were Negroes. But it also said that they were Afro-Semitic. And it is possible, based on the terminology used, Negro, Afro, Semitic. Afro, the link with Ham. But like we said, Ham was not the only black man in the Shem, Ham, Japheth equation. Ham was not the only black man. You have to get over the racial misinterpretation or the racist, actually more powerful, the racist. Actually, let me do this like this. Wasp, let me put wasp. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant races, because you know, the Egyptians and Hawass and all of them, they receive, you could say, welfare of the United States to keep their, you know, to keep food on their plate. You know, I have to say it like that. They basically are subsidized, right? Subsidized to kind of lock that down. And also many ones to put out that disinformation that no matter what we're seeing on the wall paintings, no matter what we're seeing in the artifact, no matter what we're seeing in the untouched features, right, of the statues or the monuments, like this one right here, you can see that here's features of a so-called, quote, Negro, a so-called, quote, black, person, black man, a so-called, quote, African, right? But they'll say that they were not. You know, what were they? Ah, oh, you really want to listen to Psycho Babble? Like, like, look at these right here. They'll say that these, right, these, and these are, these are kind of artifacts that from those who have actually gone over there, they're not always put out front. And there's a lot of fake, let me say this as well, there's a lot of fake Egyptology out there. Actually, where they went through the trouble to make fake artifacts. Right? In other words, to make fake artifacts off of the real artifacts. So they find a real artifact that clearly shows Negro features, black features, African features, Hamitic features. <laughs> you know what I mean? And what they would do, they go out of their way, right, to actually, you know, the science technology. Now they have the, what do they call those printers? What do they call that printer again? Huh? The 3D, thank you. The 3D printers. Yeah, they got the 3D printers. You know? And they've already been caught out there with a lot of fake artifacts. You know? We don't have all the memes here to go through that, but it's out there. Follow up on it. So right here, here, here. Getting to the root. You know, so when we look at Egypt, ancient Egypt, because it's a civilization that can be considered to be like a dead civilization. At least it was all buried under the sand and and when they be digging up things, they be digging up things from all different periods of ancient Egyptian history. So when we're looking at different, you know, monuments or wall paintings or art and facts, it's not from the same period of time, right? It could be from different periods of time. So this is why, as Gerald Macy said, he said ancient Egypt was like a mouthpiece like of, of, of Africa. I forget his subtitle on his book. But we, 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 we gravitate to that. That properly articulates that in ancient Egyptian, you know, um, studies and the artifacts, we have, we have thousands of years, right? I would say, conservatively speaking, at least between three to 5,000 years. Some would tell you going back 10 or more thousand years. But... Conserv I say conservatively based on the evidence, not based on speculation, not based on feel good, but based on where, you know, the credible science, you know, is able to date it and cross reference. We have in ancient Egyptian artifacts between three to five thousand years, not just of quote ancient quote Egyptian quote unquote history, but the history, right? The history uh, spirituality, culture, right, of that whole region of the world, especially when we're talking about Africa or the continent and especially East Africa. But what's hidden in the equation is the Ethiopia equation. Is Ethi Ethiopia, is Ethiopian the equation. We've been on a podcast for a couple of hours and we're going to seal this up right here, here, here. You know, I don't know if I sound different after we've been on the podcast for a few hours, but we just had to touch on this right here. You know, modern civilization, you know, and in spite of ones and ones presenting the evidence you see in China. Did you know, do you know the founding fathers of modern civilization 
in Europe, right? Giving the date, approximate dates and time in North America, right? It's in North America, approximate dates and time. And then over here, we have Egypt, ancient Egypt, or what, Kemet. And there we go. You see below where it says, from 12,500 B.C. in the Ethiopian highlands. Uh-oh! <laughs> in the what? Ethiopian highlands. You know, Ethiopia has been called the rooftop of Africa. We can, we can see why Ethiopia was chosen why, to establish that Israelite kingdom of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. You know why? Because like the mountains round about Jerusalem, the highlands, the rooftop of Africa. But it says from 12,500 B.C. in the Ethiopian highlands, agriculture, uh-oh, was experimented with in Africa. Well, it wasn't called Africa in 12,500 you know, but you know what we're talking about in the continent with pastoralism near 10,000 BC. From there, they say Africans. Well, actually, if it's the Ethiopian highlands, shouldn't it be Ethiopia? <laughs> From 12,500 BC in the Ethiopian highlands, agriculture was experimented with in Ethiopia or Tob. Oh, Tob, Tobia, or the good land. Tobia means like the good, referring to like to the good land. Tob, the Tob, right? A Toba, a Toba, right? That's Hebrew. A Toba, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, a Toba. We already linked that right there. With experimented with, right, the pastoral, pastoralism near 10,000 BC. From there, Ethiopians traveled to the Near East. And that's the truth of the matter. The Bible even testifies to it. In Genesis chapter 10, right? It says that Ham, Ham, had a son named what? Cush. And Cush had a son named Namrud, called Nimrod. And Nimrod, they said the beginning of his kingdom was Babal, Akkad, Arek, Kalna, over in the land, over in that, what? Near East, right? Urbide to become the origin of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, or the... Hebraically, we call the Aram Necharayim. Aram, 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 like what people say, Aramaic. Aram, right? Aram Necharayim. Necharayim. Necharayim actually mean rivers or two rivers. Remember we said between the two rivers, the lamb that was bequeathed to Abraham and his seed was the river between the river of Ethiopia or the river of Egypt. See, they call it the river of Egypt but the roots of it, the river of Egypt, is owned by, from ancient times, Ethiopia, or the inner, we could say, Tobians, or the inner Africans. But here it says right here, right, the origin of Mesopotamia, right, or the, the Aram, Aram of the two rivers. Now we have the river Euphrates and the river Nile, the river of Egypt, the river of Ethiopia, right, and Turkey. That's the Hittite country, the Hittite. The Hittites was one of the tribes of Canaan, right? As in Katal Huyuk. So when we say that the European, the white man, the Indo-European, more scientifically correct, the Indo-European is a Canaanite. And that the white man is a Hamite. And as science proves that the recessive of the so-called white genetics came out of and originated from the original black genetics. The Bible even testifies when it's properly read. But see, what's blinding them is the racist misinterpretations. The racist white Anglo-Saxon Protestant pseudo-Christian racist misinterpretation that our people have gone through for like 400 years is a ghost. It's a ghost. They got these ghosts in their head. They find it hard to get these ghosts. Even though they know it was a lie, they still are stuck on the lie. But here's the truth. In this metropolitan Ethiopia, they say Africa, but Africa is a pseudonym. Africa was first, the continent was renamed Africa of the Belgium Conference. And originally Africa was Tunisia and Libya on ancient and old maps. And that was a province of Rome. So in this metropolitan Ethiopia, individuals, see what it says? Individuals such as Nimrod or Namrud, Right, the African, no, the Ethiopian son. Remember the content called Ethiopia, the Ethiopian son of Kush. So you see what happens also? 
they throw this Africa, 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 Africa. And it's, it's the Berlin Conference Part 2. It's the, the intellectual, <laughs> right? The intellectual, <laughs> wait for it, wait for it, right? The intellectual, um, what is it the Berlin, the Belgium? I was saying Berlin, uh-oh. The intellectual Belgium. It's something that didn't feel right about that. The Intellectual Belgium Conference. Right? The Intellectual Belgium Conference. And what I mean by that? The misuse, misuse, right? And overuse, right? Of the pseudonym, right? The pseudonym Africa. A Africa to refer, right? To refer to the entire continent to the entire continent now it should be clear we've done videos and we see a lot of people have picked up on it and a lot of people are discovering for themselves that what the continent was actually called ethiopia even ethiopia upper ethiopia and lower ethiopia ain't that something ethiopia the continent that's called africa was called had one part was upper ethiopia and another part was lower ethiopia and the lower Ethiopia, they would rename to call it Negro land. And then they would further then divide it into, you know, the t nations. There's a time of the Gentiles, there's a time of the nation when the white man would run around the world carving up artificial nations. That's what the Bible means by the end time, the last days, the end of the world, the end of the world system. We live in this world system where we have the continent was once called Ethiopia, been called Africa. Where we have these 54 different, you know, different artificial nations and other artificial nations, right? And it's all based on what the so-called white man did over 400 plus years ago. Isn't that amazing? Just think about it. You know, we're kind of stuck in this modality. Right? We know it's not true, but still we have to, it's like knowing what we know, we continue to do what we do. But here at the bottom here it says individuals such as Nimrod, we know it's more than Nimrod as an individual. He was a point man. You know there were others with Nimrod. Right? Individuals such as Nimrod, the Ethiopian son of Cush, founded the world's first permanent farming communities and civilizations. Facts. But now in racist, through the racist, right, misinterpretation of the Bible and ancient history, right, through the racist interpretation, they said that he started the Tower of Babel. And then they make up this goofy story about Santa Claus and, and the two Babylons by this goofy, you know, racist you know, a guy, you know, Anthony Hislop, who hates his mother or something. I think Freud should have looked at that guy. Because everywhere he see a mother and child is, ooh, this is a big evil. And then he's talking about the Bible. But the Bible mentions that the whole mother and child thing would be something significant among the ancient peoples. Because that's that whole prophecy in Genesis. Right? But anyway, the Ethiopian... Ethiopian son of Cush. No, we are, I'm, I'm writing this down, brothers and sisters, because we need to start talking and speaking and articulating things different. We need to get out of, you know, continue. We know it's not, the content not, it was not called Africa. It's only the white man. So by continue to call it that, it's continue to walk in, you know, walk in his mindset, right? You know what I mean? Though we acknowledge that, yeah, that's what it's called now. That is not what it should be called in the future if we're to free up ourselves. That's a part of freeing ourselves, intellectually free our minds. But here, this bottom part here basically explains what we're saying about it. So that means that if it all came from that direction, what about the linguistics? Language. Right? This is why when we look in the scripture, it speaks in the New Testament about um, the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. You know that Pentecost thing in the Bible? I'm not talking about black Pentecostal churches. No, I'm talking about the Pentecostal thing in the Bible. Where they were all in the upper room, cloven tongues of fire came on their heads and they started speaking languages. They were all like Hebrews and Israelites, but they were scattered. 
So they were speaking different languages because it was scattered, like black people. You know, some black people speak like this, like in Jamaica, others speak different in Barbados. The ones in Haiti speak French. The ones on the other side of the island, you know, um, speak Spanish. And then other people speak French. Yeah, we all say French. And then over here in America, and even some of the people speak different kinds of French because they mix it up, the Creole with, with their particular indigenous languages. East Coast, West Coast, you know, over here, black Negro Americans in this North country speak different. And you see how this is divide and conquer. So in the Bible, after the crucifixion, um, um, death, burial, resurrection, right, and ascension of the black Messiah, of Jesus Christ, right, it says that they were told to wait in the upper room for, 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 for power, to get power. We talk about black power, but they, but they were someone to get power, right? And it speaks about the Holy Spirit. And what was the gift of the Holy Spirit? Was the linguistic. When it talk about speaking in tongues, it was talking about speaking linguistics. They were able to speak linguistics and break down the language barriers between one Yehudi, one black Jew that was over here in this nation and the next one. We even have the Ethiopian eunuch, right? The Ethiopian official of Kentake of the Meroe Queens, right? And he went to Jerusalem to worship. So that means that he was a Hebrew, he was a Yehudi, he was a Jew, he was a remnant of the tribes of Israel, right? That were already in that region, right? You know, since the time of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba. So I'm pointing this out to substantiate our oral traditions, our legends. They'll say that the Queen of Sheba, King Solomon is a legend. We could say the same thing about the Bible, right? It's a legend. Right? It's basically the way that people recorded their particular history. Right? But to dismiss it as not being right and accurate or factual without doing serious investigation. And when you do the investigation, when people say they're doing this investigation, they want to dismiss the scripture, dismiss the Bible. Just ask them, do you speak, not even speak, but do you study with Hebrew and Greek? And do you speak it? Because it's important to speak it. It's one thing looking at individual isolated words. Right. But then words, when they go together, you know, like individual words put together is different than when you look at the words individually. You could look at this word in a sentence and that word, each word you can break down. That still won't help you to understand the sentence unless you can read the sentence and comprehend the sentence properly. So here, 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 we're going to sum up right here with this right here. There's a little bit more. Cause we like to go a little bit deeper on this. Now, notice here they write it as Amen. Let me ask you, according to the Metu, Metu Netter, right? The Metu Netter. Is it our main, our men? Is it our moon? See, they be playing fast and loose with it. I thought it was our moon. Can you read the glyphs? If you can read the glyphs, you should be able to tell us whether it, it was our moon or our main. And that makes a big difference. And how do we know it? We know it because we're studying the linguistics of the root. We're studying the linguistics of the root of ancient Kemetic culture, of ancient Kemetic civilization, which was Tob, the Tobia. This is why you notice that a lot of the white and European scholars, and even scholars from the previous generations, they seem to have given a lot of stock to Ethiopia, right? They didn't talk about it publicly, but if you go into the academic books from past times, you'll see that there is often um, reference to Ethiopia, to the linguistics. I see that these scholars that were studying ancient Egypt, these scholars that were studying the Bible, going back, say, uh, 100, 200, even a little more than that years ago, were using the Ethiopic. They were looking at Ethiopic to even help them decipher the Bible. I point that out because it's significant, because they did that in the back room, but when they came forward, to Front Street, they mentioned very little of Ethiopia because they probably figured that if we told these Negroes that, hey, Ethiopia is the root of it and it's a black culture, they'll get to it before us. But even though many of these Kemetic and black, pro-black, pro-Egyptian and Kemetic scholars know this, right, pseudo-scholars, I say pseudo until you get your linguistic game up, you're a pseudo. You're a pseudo. You really don't know what you're talking about. All you're doing is speculate. All you're doing is freestyle scholarship. All you're doing is regurgitated scholarship, you know, and regurgitating what a white man 
right, who either knows a little bit of the language, he knows much more of a black language than you do, and you are pro-black, and you're about black power, mm. you're dirty, you need to take a shower, you need to clean up, something, 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 something's not right. Here, let's do this right here, hopefully this comes up right here, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers. Oh, man, why did this come up right here? Why did this come up right here? Hold on for a moment, brothers and sisters. Let me see. I want to show you this right here. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay, let's, let's see if we can do this right here. Give me one moment. All right, here, 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 yeah. Yeah, I got it here. I don't know what happened. I had the page on, on kind of save the page here, but it didn't come up, right? It went to another page. Okay, here's, here is the brother right here. Legacy, Legacy Alen. Alen. Well, he says it as Alen, right? But it's spelled A L L Y N. Legacy. These are some of the books that he has right here um, Tigrinya, Amrinya, and Tigrinya, the Kal hieroglyphics for beginners. So, what he's doing is going to the root culture, right? That root culture, which we find it to be preserved, at least the linguistic keys are preserved even among the modern descendants of these ancient peoples and when we're looking at Ethiopia and looking at different peoples that comprise Ethiopia whether so-called Shemitic or Hamitic or Afro-Shemitic we have the linguistic and the linguistic provides us the key to the real correct right and accurate decipherment of ancient Egypt of ancient Kemet that's so always began off like where would you know, where would um, Kemet, ancient Egypt, be without Ethiopia? So we have this book here. Um, we have the Ethiopian culture of ancient Egypt. You see that? There was a 2009 book. He has a 2015 book. There's this one, Amrinya and Tigrinya, Kal, Roots of Female Names. Then it'll go over here, Amrinya. Oh, this is the one. Amrinya, Tigrinya, the Papyrus of Ani. That's a 2001, the Papyrus of Ani. Then he has Amarinya Tigrinya Kal, Roots of Hindi Languages. Got to see this one right here. Check this book out right there because some reasoning has come up about Sanskrit, which is a very interesting reasoning. Um, then Amarinya Tigrinya Kal, Roots of English Language. Also very, very important. Now, one's like, um, what's the name? One of the, I'll say one, he was one of the better scholars, so to speak, right? Gerald Macy, right? He also speculated, well, he looked at the, the evidence and he speculated that Ethiopia is the roots of ancient Egypt and also of like the Hebrew, we could say some of the primary Hebrew artifacts, you know, that it comes from Ethiopia. And what we have in Ethiopia, we have the linguistic keys to decipher and this is what we need we need the keys the language is the key the linguistic is the key then there's the, this one over here the last one of 2018 is Amarinya and Tigrinya Kal by Genesis Genesis now the first one we have got a copy of there's another one I don't see it right here but more about this brother right here um, you can see, I don't know if this is audio books. Is this audio books? Um, you can check him out, Legacy Alen, books, biography, blog, audio books, Kindle, Amazon, right? And you can just, just take down the name right there, right? And look into his books right there. Is this the brother? I mean, this is the brother here. I never met him, but we have conversated right here. Hail up, brother Legacy Alen. You know, like to, you know, reason with you. And um, we're like ones and ones to get your book so that they will recognize what we recognize. Down here, you see the Amarinya and Tigrinya Kal Rosetta Stone. It goes into the Rosetta Stone right there. Um, goes into, there's also the Ethiopian culture. This is another cover right there. I don't know if it's another book, but another cover right there. But these, this, this is real scholarship. Yeah, it's unsung, but it's real scholarship. But the reason why I think a lot of other, some of these pseudo scholars that keep regurgitating a lot of pseudo is because 
once you get into the truth, you may have to look at everything else that you believe and throw it out. And a lot of these ones and ones have built whole careers on a lot of pseudo information for them to have to then, you know, reconsider it right in the light of the truth means that they will have to go back on a lot of things that they said and they allege and they might even have to admit that they were wrong. And, you know, some of these prideful people, maybe they can't admit they were wrong. Oh, he got one Amarinya, Tigrinya, Kal roots of Hebrew language. I like to check that one out. Right, right there. See what he says right there. But his connection of ancient Egypt, right, with the roots of ancient Egypt and the linguistic, this is the real scholarship. And he's like a pioneer in this research right here. The work that he has done, many ones have assumed and um, kind of put two and two together. You know, the Nile flows down from Ethiopia. The ancient Egyptians said that the gods come from the direction of Ethiopia, the Kui land. They refer to Ethiopia as the Kui land, which may be interpreted as something as, from the Metuneta as a spiritual land, the spiritual land, a holy land, the land of the gods, you know, and therefore the linguistics. Right? Even the culturally, we can look at a lot of the Ethiopian cultures of the different tribes. There are different tribes, different people groups in Ethiopia. And what's amazing is that if we look at different of the people groups, the so-called tribes in Ethiopia, right? Not just the main ones, ones here about Tigrin, you know, Tigra people, right? Tigris Euphrates River is in the east, the Tigra and Tigris. They have, they speak a Shemitic language and are considered a Shemitic people, and they are a black people. And then Nimrod went as far, he crossed the Tigris Euphrates River. He went across the Tigris Euphrates River. And then, see this connection there? There's some sort of connection there. Then we have the, you know, the Oromo people. But we have many different peoples, and when we look at the different peoples, groups in the ancient culture, we can see a lot of correspondence to what we're seeing on the wall paintings, on the monuments. So that right there should be, you know, even more proof. What, what is it right here? Oh, Legacy has a book that says, Woman Who Invented Writing in Ancient Egyptian Civilization. You see it right there? Woman who invented writing in ancient Egyptian civilization. Missing link in technology. Am Amarinya and Tigrinya Kal Genesis. Right? And he also goes into the, um, what is that, the book of the, what's called the Book of the Dead. So we'd like to get a list of all the books he has and really, you know, catch up on our studies. Let's see if we can bring this up here as the outro. Where's that book about? about there we go right there this one right here the papyrus of ani right the book of the dead retranslation plate one check it out check it out volume one right here ethiopia ancient ethiopia the root of ancient kemet check out the description brothers and sisters you can link i and i in the description give thanks to those who support this ministry also check out loj s.org podcast links in the description shalom habarim shalom heal up legacy alan shalom wendemay